we said that there were two fundamental strategies to search and find reachability in graphs. One was breadth first and now we will look at depth first search. So in depth first search, we start from some vertex and we look at any one unexplored neighbor and then from that explored neighbor, we will not come back and look at more unexplored neighbors of the original vertex, but rather we will go to J and then proceed from J. Right? So we kind of follow a long path until we get stuck and then we come back. So unlike breadth first search where we explore all the neighbors at the first level, then all the neighbors at the second level, here we will kind of follow exploration. So it is sort of like if you are reading a web page right? and the first link that you come across, instead of reading the rest of the text, you click on that link and you go to a new web page. And now the first link that you see on that, you click on that and go to a new web page. So you are kind of getting infinitely distracted from what you were doing earlier, but this in a finite graph will actually work. So we will continue until we reach a vertex which has no unexplored neighbors. Right? And when we hit that point, because we did not look at all the neighbors before, right? when we looked at a vertex, we explored the first neighbor that we found. Maybe the second neighbor has not been explored yet. It could have been explored also because we could have reached it in a roundabout way after going through that first neighbor. But if we find a neighbor which is not explored, we will visit that. So we kind of backtrack, but we backtrack systematically. So we take the last place we got stuck, come back to the previous step, backtrack there, then come back to this, backtrack there and so on. So in order to do the systematic backtracking, we will use a different data structure from what we did for the breadth first search. In the breadth first search, in order to process vertices, we put them in a queue. So every time we saw a new visited vertex which is unexplored, we put it in a queue and they all came up for exploration in the order in which they went into the queue. So earlier vertices got processed before later vertices. Whereas in depth first search, this is not going to happen in general because the earlier vertices which are not, which, which are neighbors of uh, which could have been seen later will be processed only later. But we want to make sure that when we backtrack, we go back to the most recent vertex from which we made a choice. That is why we use a stack. So a stack is a last in first out. So just imagine a stack like a stack of books, right? You put a book on top of the stack, the book that you take out will be the one you put last. So if you want the second last book, you have to take out the top book and then take out, you cannot pull out something from in between. So if we run depth first search, for example, from vertex 4 here, then we can take any one of its neighbors. So it has 0 and 3 and 7. So if we take the smallest one, for instance, 0, right? So we mark it and then we explore, say the strategy is that we will explore the smallest outgoing vertex from a given uh, vertex, right? So 4, now, so now I have basically put 4 on the stack saying that I have not finished with 4. Okay, the thing that I had done with 4 was incomplete but I am now processing 0. So now I look at the neighbors of 0. So the neighbors of 0 are 1 and 2, right? And if I look at them in this order, then I will find that 1 is not yet visited. So I will suspend 0 and look at 1 instead, right? So now 0 has been put on top of 4 on the stack. So the stack is growing from left to right. So the stack is growing in this direction, right? So now I have suspended 4 in the process of exploring neighbors of 4, I have suspended 0 and now I am looking at neighbors of 1. So when I look at the neighbors of 1, I find that it has 2 neighbors, 0 and 2, but only one of them, 2, is unexplored. So I will suspend the 1 and explore 2 instead. But 2 has neighbors which are already explored. So the exploration of 2 does not get me anywhere. So this is a situation where I get stuck, right? So I get stuck here. So since I get stuck, I have to go back and say, okay, I have nothing I can do here. So I go back to 1 and I ask, was there anything left pending in 1 which I could do now that I know that 2 is a dead end? So I go back to 1, right? So I pull 1 off the stack and I say, okay, now let me look at its neighbors again and see if there is anything left to do. And I find there is nothing left to do because it had only 2 neighbors, 0 and 2. 0 I anyway had ignored because 0 was marked right at the beginning and I just marked 2. So now I say this 1 is also a dead end for me. So I backtrack to 0. Now I look at what was left was 0. So when I went from 0 to 1, 2 was unexplored. But notice that I, I came through this roundabout route and I explored 2. So now if I look at 0 to 2 directly, I find that it is already been visited by some other uh, you know, exploration which I initiated earlier. So though 0 has never explored 2 itself, by the time 0 looks at 2, 2 is visited. 
right? So this is unlike breadth-first search where 2 would be visited only from 0, it will not be visited from somewhere else. So 0 visits, cannot visit 2, so I now I backtrack back to 4. So now I basically have come back to the first vertex I started with saying that whatever I did in the direction 0 has now completed, there is nothing more to search below 0. So I look at my next neighbor which is 3, right? So I say okay, let me suspend 4 again and explore 3. Now 3 will suspend itself and explore 5 because that is the smaller of the two unvisited neighbors. 5 will suspend itself and explore 6 because that is the smaller of the two uns unvisited neighbors. But 6 has no new neighbors to visit because 6 has neighbors 3 and 5 which are both marked as visited. So 6 will say backtrack to 5. So now I have something interesting because I, have, I went that way but I still have these two pending. So backtracking to 5 allows me to do more things. I do not have to go all the way back to 4 like we did last time. So 5 will say oh let me now explore 7 instead, right. So I suspend 5 one more time, right and this time I explore 7. From 7 I can explore 8 because 4 and 5 are known but 8 is not. So I suspend 7 explore 8, from 8 I explore 9, right. Now 9 is a dead end. So having explored 9, I will come back and backtrack to 8 but there is nothing more to see from 8, so I backtrack to 7. There is nothing more to see from 7, so I backtrack to 5. There is nothing more to see from 5, so I backtrack to 3. There is nothing more to see from 3, so I backtrack to 4 and now the stack is empty, so there is nothing pending, I have seen everything and as you can see because it is the same graph and hopefully you should get the same result, everything is actually reachable from 4. Okay, so this is how depth first search works with a stack. Now when we implemented breadth first search, we actually had to construct that queue. If you remember we created a class called queue and we created a queue object and kept track of it. So you might imagine that when you do depth first search, you have to do the same thing, you have to create a stack object and keep track of it. However, it turns out that you can actually implement depth first search using recursion and recursion implicitly keeps a stack, okay. So, the thing about depth first search is if you want to do it recursively, then you must separate out the initialization from the recursive call because otherwise every time you initial you call depth first search, if it initializes all the visited to be false and all that, it is going to be a, something that would not work. So there is an initialization phase, right, where you as always set in this case say let us do it in one shot which is visited and parent, right. So we set visited to be the empty dictionary the parent to be the empty dictionary and then for having extracted the number of, so this is with an adjacency matrix, having extracted the number of rows, we can set all the vertices to not be visited and all of them to have parent minus 1, right. So this is an initialization phase, so what it does is it returns an initialized version of parent and visited, right. So we now have to take this initialized version of parent and visited and pass it through to DFS. So the actual DFS is here, okay. So DFS now the way I have written it takes four parameters. It takes the matrix of the graph, it takes the vertex to start and it also takes the current status of visited and parent, right. So what does it do, right. So it basically calls itself. So it does the obvious thing that it visits the vertex which it has been told to visit. So it sets visited of v to be true and for every neighbor, if it is not visited, it sets the parent. So all this is familiar to us. This is what we do whether you are doing breadth first search or depth first search. But now this is the new thing which is I do not proceed with the next neighbor. So I am looking at all the neighbors but I am not, if I see one neighbor which is not visited, I kind of suspend myself and this is done now implicitly through recursion. I re start DFS from the new vertex k which I just saw and I pass the current value visited and parent, it is going to return back to me an updated value of visited and parent. So finally DFS when it concludes gives back, so basically each time I visit something it update visited and parent gives it back to me, right. So this is the recursive nature of DFS. Now here because we have essentially made visited and parent kind of internal to DFS, we have to keep passing it around, right. We have to call DFS with visited and parent and get it back. This is a little bit cumbersome and this is not how you would normally see it presented if you see a, an implementation in a language other than Python. So usually in, in, in presentations of DFS, 
they will assume that this visited and parent in this case dictionaries or lists or arrays or whatever you are using to store that are actually global val values which you can access from inside DFS and so you can update them from inside DFS without having to pass them around. So we can also do that so we can make visited and parent global so we declare outside all our functions these two empty dictionaries called visited and parent and now because Python has this convention that all mutable values a mutable value is either a list or a dictionary a mutable value can be globally referenced from inside a function so this is one of the decisions that python has made which is basically to take care of this situation so you don't have to keep passing lists and dictionaries in and out of functions i still have to initialize it but the initialization happens now in this case without having to pass the dictionary so remember in the earlier thing the initialization actually returned back the initialized visited and parent dictionary here it's just going to initialize it so it's going to do the same thing right it's going to run through a loop but now it's initializing it outside so this visited and parent dictionary are outside the function it's just setting them up so i will have to first call this function to initialize it and now when i do the dfs itself i only have to pass the functions uh, the parameters which i would expect to pass which is the matrix and the vertex to start with so I set visited of this vertex to be true and then for every neighbor if it is not visited I will call DFS with that. Earlier I had to call it with an updated value of visited and parent and get it back. So this is a simpler easier to understand version and this recursive function is implicitly manipulating this visited and parent which are sitting outside right. So that is something so these updates here setting visited v equal to true and setting parent k equal to v these are happening to this global data structure which is outside so there is something to keep in mind. Now you can do the same thing uh, with an adjacency list so first let us look at the version where we have this thing passing around right so as before except that we have a list right you will initialize these dictionaries to be empty so this is the version where visited and parent are maintained inside the function so we have to keep passing them around so I will initialize them using the list of keys of the adjacency list but otherwise it's the same thing I update it to false and minus one and I return the initialized arrays right and now when I call DFS list I have to pass visited and parent so again I do the same thing I set visited to true and instead of checking the neighboring function which looks at all the rows in the matrix I just check the adjacency list of the current vertex and for every such thing if it is not visited right I will set its parent to be the current vertex and I will call recursively DFS with the current value of visited and parent and get back an updated value of visited and parent and finally DFS when it returns has to return this updated value. So this is the non-global version of DFS using an adjacency list and here is the global version of DFS using an adjacency list so as before now we make visited and parent dictionaries which are outside so when we initialize we only initialize but we do not return the initialized values because they are being globally updated and the only change is that the loop for initialization runs over the keys of the adjacency list rather than the columns of the matrix and then the DFS itself is the same thing the only difference is that instead of looking for the neighbors of k uh, v which looks at all the columns in the matrix I just look at the list of neighbors of v right and if it is not visited I set the parent and I call it again right. So, so these are now four different implementations of DFS which I have shown you with and without with an adjacency matrix with an adjacency list and maintaining visited and parent globally and locally right. So all four of them work and it is a question of which one you find most convenient generally if, if these are large values large dictionaries is this generally desirable not to pass them around. So global things make it easier to uh, to write because you do not have to pass these dictionaries and remember to call them and get the updated value. So usually for such things the global version is preferred. So what about the complexity well the complexity despite all this recursion is very similar to BFS right so every vertex is visited once so it is marked as visited once and it is explored once right so you call DFS from that vertex only once. So at that sense we do order n processing in terms of vertices you never see a vertex twice right and as before uh, 
in order to explore a vertex to decide which of its neighbors to process, we have to check which are all the neighbors. And in an adjacency matrix, it takes order n time. And in an adjacency list, it takes degree v time. So as exactly as in the BFS, if we do this thing with an adjacency matrix, right, we get an order n squared algorithm. If we do it in an adjacency list, we get an order m plus n algorithm. So there is no difference in the worst case running time. Of course, there will be a cost due to recursion, which we are not going to worry about right now. But otherwise, in terms of the number of times you process these vertices and edges, we have this usual scaling of going from n squared to m plus n. So DFS is a different strategy from PFS and it uses a stack rather than a queue and the stack is implicit when we do it recursively. Now BFS we said gives us some extra bonus which is that you get shortest paths, right? So we did two things with BFS. We first recovered the path using parent and then we used this level function to di discover the distance. Now in the BFS, we only did the parent part. We did not do the level part and that's because as we saw, right, even in that example, we saw that like if I had 0, 1 and 2 connected like this, it could be that DFS finds this path because it suspends 0, then it suspends 1, whereas of course there is a shorter path. So DFS is not generally going to find the shortest path. So even though the parent thing tells us something about one way of getting there, it's not really the fastest way. So DFS doesn't have that advantage. So you might ask, I mean, you have to do all this work, you have to do recursion, you have to do all this, and at the end you don't even get this information. What is the point of DFS? It turns out that for other things, DFS is very useful. So actually, if on the balance of things, DFS is a more informative search than breadth first search, right? So we will look at examples in, in a subsequent lecture as to why DFS gives you very useful information about the structure of a graph and therefore very often DFS is the primary way of exploring a graph rather than BFS.